40,000 words of Mandarin are derived from Sanskrit. And where did this come from? Story of Shiva uh, destroying Dakshas, who was his father-in-law's sacrifice because Sati killed herself because uh, Daksha didn't um, um, invite Shiva. But this is really an astronomical story that uh, the sun and the moon are each 108 times their respective diameter from the earth, right? That the sun is 108 times its diameter from the earth, the moon is 108 times its diameter from the earth, and modern astronomy also tells you that the diameter of the sun is 108 times the diameter of the earth. Namaste, Subhashi. Thank you, Ravi ji. Uh, it's great to be a part of your show. And uh, looking forward to this conversation with uh, all the audience and you guys. So our speaker for today is a renowned scholar of repute, a scholar par excellence, whose area of research covers several variety of subjects, an archaeoastronomer, a Vedic scholar, a distinguished poet and author, a historical revisionist, as well as a member of the Indian Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council, PMSTIAC. It's my privilege today to introduce to you all Padmashri Dr. Subhashkar. Subhashji, who hails from Srinagar, did his schooling and college education in various places in Jammu and Kashmir. He obtained his doctorate in electrical engineering from IIT Delhi. Subhashji has been a visiting faculty at the Imperial College London, as well as a guest lecturer at Bell Laboratories, Murray Hill. He has also been a visiting research scientist at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, India. For almost three decades, Subhashji served as the Donald C. and Elaine T. DeLon Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Louisiana State University. Subhashji's area of expertise includes the fields of information theory, cryptography, quantum information, neural networks, archaeoastronomy, Vedic knowledge systems, etc. Subhashji has received a patent for a family of instant instantaneously trained neural networks of which he was the inventor. These networks can be used for a variety of artificial intelligence applications. Subhashji ascertains that three kinds of language can be connected to brain function, and those would include reorganizational, associative, and quantum. He has put forth information based on the limitations of the capabilities of quantum computers and has also proposed a new measure of information for quantum systems. Along with this work, Subhashji has also put forward a resolution of the twin paradox of relativity theory. Both works garnered a lot of attention of the mainstream media. Being an archaeoastronomer as well as a Vedic scholar, Subhashji's discovery of a long forgotten astronomy of ancient India has been termed revolutionary and approach making by prominent scholars. In 2008-2009, he was appointed one of the principal editors for the ICOMOS project of UNESCO for identification of world heritage sites. Subhashji is both a distinguished author as well as a poet. He has written over 30 books of which six are collections of poems. Subhashji's poetry has been compared to that of William Wordsworth by the distinguished Indian scholar Govind Chandra Pandey. Of Subhashji's books, I'm mentioning just a few here. I'm not doing any justice by, you know, just cutting it down. Subhashji had given me a list. It's a fabulous, mind-blowing number of books. I'll just cut down to write two. So a few of them are the Ashwamedha, the right and its logic, in search of the cradle of civilization, the Astronomical Code of Rig Veda, the Prajna Sutra, Aphorisms of Intuition, etc. Over nine works of poetry that also include two in Hindi, several encyclopedia articles, journals that have several articles coming under different sections. Again, mind-blowing, mind-blowing list. Linguistics, Sanskrit and computer science, ancient astronomy, archaeoastronomy and archaeology, art and music, Temple Evolution and Architecture, Vedic Studies, History of Science and Mathematics, Indus Script and Writing, Indian History, Ayurveda, Consciousness Studies, and quite a few general articles as well. So coming down to the two latest books of Subhashti's, The Idea of India, Bharat as a Civilization, which was published in 2023, 
is a condensation of new research that provides an authentic picture of what india means to her own people and those living in west asia europe and east asia a must read for every student of indian culture science and history this book also describes the contributions of india to the world to science as well as her influence on her neighbors finally last but not the least subhashti's latest book which was published in 2024 the eternal bharat truth meaning and beauty this book gets into india's rich civilization highlighting profound insights into reality through art and culture while it explores the essence of ancient indian wisdom and maps the cosmic processes through the lens of timeless texts such as the vedas and the upanishads it offers a bridge between ancient wisdom and modern understanding thus serving as a gateway to understanding india's profound knowledge and civilizational past in 2019 the government of india awarded subhashti the fourth highest civilian award in india the padma shri for his contributions currently he is the regents professor of department of computer science at the oklahoma state university stillwater as well as an honorary visiting professor of engineering at the jawaharlal nehru university and subhashti also continues to be the member of pm stiac that is the prime minister's science technology and innovation advisory council subhashji it is indeed an honor to have you amongst us here with us on satyamev jt thank you so, so much for joining us we are extremely grateful to you looking forward to your awe inspiring talk thank you so much over to you ravi thank you uh, thank you uh, vidya ji and thank you ravi ji um, delighted to be a part of um, Uh, clubhouse satyameva jayate clubhouse uh, what i'm going to do uh, is uh, give a very quick uh, overview of uh, indian uh, scientific contributions both in the ancient period as well as the modern period now in the ancient period uh, uh, people know about uh, the zero uh, invention of zero and how it changed mathematics all over the world uh, but in uh, in addition to that uh, it's uh, much uh, less known that um, that um, india already had a very rich uh, uh, tradition in physics as uh, in kanada's uh, vaisheshika sutras for for some strange reason um, they are not a part of the uh, curriculum in indian schools uh, and colleges and uh, i wasn't uh, aware of the details myself uh, even though i've been working on history of science for a long long time but um, uh, several years ago uh, i was asked to write a essay on indian physics and that prompted me to take a, a fresh look and i translated uh, the vaisheshika sutras in a book called matter and mind uh, which was published i think 8 years ago and i was absolutely astonished the whole um, framing of what physics is and how to approach uh, it um, both from the perspective of things as they are which is you know matter and how information about things as they are is obtained by us which is accumulation of knowledge there are two aspects to science one is reality as it is and then secondly our interface with reality and it as astonished uh, for example uh, there is a very clear statement in the vaisheshika sutras <clears throat> that everything there is to know about physical reality will be obtained by uh, by uh, properties of matter of uh, motion and properties of matter substances and their motions you know that's absolutely modern how do we um, create modern physics you have substances uh, and and their motions and their interactions so this is one and secondly that as far as uh, our meaning human uh understanding of what uh, this reality is there are three aspects to it one is uh, uh one is Uh, samanya which is universal which are universal principles the other is uh, uh, vishesh which is where vaisheshika comes from which depends upon how exactly you interact with it 
And the third is Samavaya, the, the place of interaction uh, between the outer and the inner. Beautiful. It's beautiful. In fact, both of these uh, constitute two triangles and it becomes somewhat like a Shiva Shakti uh, triangle that we have uh, that people who do yoga are very well familiar with. So, <laughs> so this is one and it, <coughs> sorry, uh, the Vaisheshika Sutras also speak about uh, um, four kinds of uh, atoms uh, or anu uh, and uh, uh, they correspond to the four non- um, uh, non non akasha bhutas and what are these bhutas the prithvi apas tejas and vayu so prithvi and apas contribute to um, the main uh, uh, mass um, using our modern technology uh, and tejas and vayu tejas corresponds to of course light and heat and vayu corresponds to the process which uh, which um, contribute to decay. You know, it seems very, very interesting if one were to uh, again use modern categories to interpret it. Uh, Prithvi would correspond to uh, proton. Uh, uh, Apas would correspond to electron because they, you know, these are two main modes, uh, solid and liquid. Uh, Apas is fluid. That's where that that's where liquid comes in from and then um, then tejas would correspond to photons and decay is neutrino i'm not saying that uh, kanada knew this but uh, from an intuition point of view there is this uh, magnificent uh, parallel and all of these uh, are uh, discrete these are discrete particles now akasha by itself is continuous and then there's something very very interesting in um, you know, Vaisheshika Sutras which is that Dick and Kal which is space and time are also a contribution or a uh, uh, they evolve from the mind so there are there is the five Mahabhutas at the bottom and then on top of that come Dick and Kal and so on and then uh, you have uh, Atman and finally mind at the very top because that's where we obtain our uh, understanding from. So this is, I think this is quite remarkable and uh, there should be a uh, wider understanding of the ideas in the Vaisheshika Sutras. Now, uh, Kanada also gives uh, uh, principles or laws of motion and two of which are virtually identical to Newton's laws of motion. <laughs> and uh, the, the first one, of course, is that um, an object will continue in its state unless you provide some momentum to it, uh, which is called nodana. Or, and the other one is the Newton third law of, uh, law, uh, third law of motion, which is that to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, so it's almost in exactly the same form. Uh, that we have it in Sanskrit as well. So this is physics, which is, of course, um, provided the context, because after all, uh, Vaisheshika is one of the six great darshanas that we have, which go back to very early times. You have also Sankhya, which provides a cosmology and also the very structure of the, uh, of the processes within the individual, which make it possible for you to comprehend because you have uh, Purush, which is the Atman, then you have Prakriti, the embodied reality, and from there emerge uh, Mana, Buddhi, and Ahankar, and then you have the uh, Gyanendriyas, the Karmendriyas, the Tanamatras, and the Mahabhutas, right? So there's a whole complex which provides us uh, a means to uh, understand uh, also the very organization of the mind that this that the mind has uh, three aspects one is uh, of course the or the body has three aspects as reflected in the mind one is the sthula sharir which is the gross body the second is the sukshma sharir which corresponds to um, you know, the memories and the intellect manas and buddhi 
And then finally, on top of that is the Karan Shiri, which is where Ahankar, etc. And, uh, and the unconscious are located, which one doesn't normally question. So it provides us an understanding, a three-layered understanding of the mind itself, which is still of relevance because, as we know, uh, the Western approach to mind or the psyche or in psychology is to look at the mind uh, more as a black box. And of course, uh, then Freud came along or Jung came along and they took a lot of ideas from, from India and elsewhere. And they, Freud spoke about conscious and the unconscious and Jung spoke about the archetype, etc. There, of course, he was borrowing uh, directly from India. But I think they, uh, the model that we have in yoga or Vedanta is much richer even now. And um, uh, Western psychology, which uh, seems to um, seems to be facing a crisis related to, you know, if um, mind or consciousness uh, is an emergent phenomenon inside the brain, uh, out of all the electrical activity inside the brain, then where is the conscious self located in the brain? They're not being able to find it. And then even if it was located at a certain point, how would uh, neurons or just a set of neurons have the capacity to deal with all the stuff that's coming in and create this sense of awareness? Because that's, our, after all, the ultimate mystery. Uh, where does awareness come, come in from? Um, which goes beyond just the computation aspect of consciousness. You know, one aspect is computation, which is something that we can also endow to machines, right? Pattern recognition, generalization. But the other is awareness, which, of course, lies beyond what the capacity of machines is. But uh, let me quickly go over a few other <clears throat> aspects of uh um, contributions from ancient India towards science. We know about mathematics and geometry uh, and cosmology. Uh, if you go back to the Mahabharata or even Yoga Vasishta and many other Puranic texts, you'll see <coughs> that there is a very clear exposition of cycles of creation, uh, srishti and pralaya. And What's very interesting is that when it comes to pralaya, it's uh, stated, uh, there's a famous passage, for example, in the Mahabharata, that the sun itself will become larger and larger, and then the earth will fall into it, then all the uh, all matter will become liquid, uh, you know, apus, then it all will become a fire, then it, then it will all get converted into a wind uh, across the cosmos, and then It'll become, it'll be absorbed into Akasha and from Akasha into the mind. And then you have the inverse uh, process. Now, this has some very interesting parallels with, uh, with uh, speculations or ideas in modern physics where it's uh, argued that uh, uh, stars eventually become red giants. You know, when the sun will run out of its fuel, it'll become a red giant. It's diameter will become, become so huge that the planets will fall into it. Now, there's another very interesting parallel, and uh, there is mention of it, um, I believe, in one of the Puranas, and I've quoted and quoted uh, the exact reference in, in my tweets and so on, where uh, it's argued that the total number of species on Earth is exactly uh, 8.4 million, which is equivalent to the current um, uh, speculations, you know, estimates of how many different species, yonis, you know, yonis in Sanskrit, how many yonis, 8.4 uh, 8 million. Now, of course, coincidences, one might say that this is, uh, this is coincidences, and you also have uh, the, uh, the speed of light, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a reference in, um, uh, I think, uh, this goes back to Bhaskaracharya, but certainly in Sayana's uh, um, Bhashya on the Rig Veda, where, uh, where he's uh, talking of the, uh, sukta, the Surya Sukta, one of the Surya Suktas, where he says that you who travels at the speed of 2002 Yojanas in half animation, and when you convert that into modern units, kilometers and seconds or miles 
uh, seconds, it's exactly equal to the speed of light. Now, of course, somebody might say, well, these are coincidences or what do we, that doesn't mean science. And I, I'm quite uh, sympathetic to um, uh, that, uh, that kind of uh, criticism. But the other perspective of looking at it is that, well, it opens up this whole question of what is consciousness? You know, reality has two aspects. One is the physical reality. The other is consciousness. We conceive of the physical reality in our consciousness. So the question is, what is primary? Western science, physical reality is primary and consciousness is a kind of an afterthought. It's emergent. But in the Vedic tradition, in the Bharatiya tradition, uh, consciousness and physical reality are two like two sides of the same coin. Um, consciousness is para and physical reality is apara. Apara meaning which is um, uh, open to analysis by language, perception, relationships, which is where uh, ordinary sciences come from, you know, as in the uh, Mundaka Upanishad, uh, uh, that there are two kinds of vidyas, apara and para. And para is transcendent. Consciousness is transcendent. Atma is transcendent, right? So there is this uh, division. And what's also fascinating uh, that, uh, um, that this understanding uh, literally goes to the, the evolution of modern science. Uh, if you go to the foundations of quantum mechanics, as we know, uh, uh, Schrodinger, one of the two creators of quantum mechanics, and this is 1930s, uh, was a Vedantin. And uh, when he wrote his autobiography uh, in the 1950s, he claimed that the central idea of, uh, the quantum, of quantum mechanics came to him from the Upanishadic Mahavakya. I am Atma Brahma. That this Atman it has the capacity to conceive the entire cosmos. So this gave him the idea that the micro object, the micro particle, the electron or proton or whatever else is a superposition of all possibilities. Okay. So this, in fact, if somebody were to ask me, how do you uh, teach quantum mechanics or what are the two basic axioms of quantum mechanics? This is one that the object, every object, objective state is a superposition of all possibilities and these possibilities could be mutually exclusive in other words a quantum mechanical shoe would be simultaneously brown and black and purple and all the colors that you can think of which are mutually exclusive but as in vaisheshika sutra when you interact with this reality through that process of samavaya you can have access to only one of those possibilities and this is called the collapse um, axiom of quantum mechanics, that when the observer interacts with the physical system, he has access to only one of the many different possibilities associated with the system. <clears throat> so this is very interesting. Now, I also want to, um, talking about ancient uh, uh, Indian science, I also, went, also want to mention Panini. Panani lived about 500 BCE, and um, he wrote um, um, or he summarized or was able to uh, express um, all of Sanskrit in terms of 4,000 algebraic rules, which also included rules about rules, right? These 4,000 sutras. And uh, it's been... Uh, uh, claimed by computer scientists that um, Panini's system uh, is equivalent to the most powerful computing machine, a Turing machine, because it's able to generate all possible sentences of Sanskrit. The most powerful computing machine uh, should be able to generate all possible uh, correct uh, expressions in a natural language. 
So it really is a program because it also has rules about tools, which is what a computer program has. It has certain expressions. Then it also has certain rules about how those expressions are to be processed, right? So in a certain fundamental sense, Panini uh, can be viewed as the very father of all of computational sciences. And that's one side to it. And the other side is that uh, in the early 1900s, uh, Panini's ideas, when they were understood uh, to a certain extent in Europe, it led to a lot of modern sciences of um, or disciplines of sociology and anthropology. Because the whole idea was that if you can describe language, which is a human construct, you can also describe relationships which are like this, likewise human constructs, like right? in sociology, what is allowed and what is not allowed. For example, certain relationships in a social system are taboo, they're not allowed. Just like in grammar, certain expressions are not allowed, right? So this is how uh, de Saussure, he was a very famous French uh, scholar who's considered the father of sociology and anthropology. And then you come to a lot of the sciences which are a part of university disciplines where the actual parentage can be taken back to um, Parani. Now, uh, the other aspect of um, computation is, of course, uh, um, uh, logic, mathematical logic. How do you create a computer? Of course, you need a programming language or rules which you can uh, use without actually having a physical computer, right? You can, as has been done in the Sanskrit tradition for the past 2,500 years, you know, people have used Ashtadhyayi or the Mahabhashya Patanjali and many other um, grammars which came along later uh, to speak about expressions um, and, and how to deal with them. But if you want to construct a computer, you need uh, to process them automatically uh, in terms of a machine, and you need mathematical logic. Now, uh, the uh, fathers of mathematical logic are normally viewed as these three English uh, scholars in the 1850s by name uh, Augustus de Morgan, uh, Charles Babbage, and um, uh, the third is, um, oh, I, I, I forget his name. Um, we use uh, his constructions in logic all the time. Um, well, there's, there was a third individual as well. I, I forget his name. Um, so um, they've been very justly celebrated. But then, um, yeah, Boole, George, George Boole, Boolean algebra, as anybody who's done... Um, computer science would have heard about Boolean algebra. George Boole was a third of this uh, trimovirate. Now, George Boole died in the 1860s, and his wife, Mary, uh, she was a uh, science writer uh, in her, you know, accomplished science writer of her times. She wrote a very famous uh, uh, essay in the 1890s where she said that, look, uh, people have um, uh, praised uh, her um, deceased husband, Bull and Morgan and Charles Babbage, but people don't know that their real teacher uh, was somebody called George Everest, who had spent decades in India as a surveyor general of India, who used to come to London uh, from time to time during summers, and he had a salon. And in the salon, he would tell these three guys that, look, he had learned in India that there is a system of logical analysis, which is absolutely incredible, which doesn't exist anywhere else. And that system of logical analysis is, now that we know it, was Navya Nyaya. And Navya Nyaya goes back to about 800 C, about 1200 years ago. Uh, in East India, in Bihar, and Bengal. And uh, Navi Nyaya, uh, modern uh, logicians have discovered, is exactly equivalent to mathematical logic. So basically, George Everest learned it. And then, of course, he was to come back to India. And uh, the peak, Sagaramatha, 
of Nepal was uh, named after him. Um, um, Mount Everest was named after him. And he he died in, I believe, in Masuri, uh, which is in present-day Uttarakhand. But basically, uh, it appears what he did was he took the Navinaya that he had learned in India, took it to London, taught it to a, uh, as a mentor. And of course, they gave it a symbolic form, which was their contribution. But the ideas of conditional logic, which is what mathematical logic is, was already there a long, long time for centuries <coughs> in India. <coughs> okay, now um, I also want to talk about inoculation. Uh, inoculation has been very much in the news uh, due to COVID, the vaccines, um, and um, um, the origins of inoculation go back to uh, Ayurveda, and uh, for smallpox, uh, um, there used to be a whole process every year. Uh, uh, people used to um, fan out uh, into the countryside and use previous year's uh, postules, you know, of smallpox, uh, and prick that into the arms of people. And according to the uh, British doctor who saw it first, um, almost, you know, it was absolutely foolproof. And I think the phrase that he uses is that not even a one person out of a million died. So there was a system. And then uh, we know that uh, in England, uh, cowpox was used. And that's what gave rise to modern uh, tradition of inoculation. But apparently it was a much older uh, part of the Ayurvedic tradition. In fact, I wrote a essay on this on uh, inoculation in Ayurveda in one of the encyclopedias. If you Google it, you'll find it with all the references. So this is one interesting side to it. Now, I should also add um, uh, that the scientific revolution itself, uh, scientific revolution uh, is generally viewed as having emerged out of the work of Newton and Leibniz with the invention of calculus and infinite series, uh, which is uh, 1600s, right? 1600s. But uh, modern scholarship has shown that at least 200 prior, 200 years prior to it, uh, infinite series and calculus uh, had already been uh, developed uh, to a great extent in South India in what is called the Kerala School of Mathematics and Astronomy, which had also made amazing contributions to astronomy itself. And um, uh, people have uh, argued that Jesuits were present in India at that time, and they took these ideas and took them to Europe. And it took Europe some time to sort of understand it, which is not to say that like uh, Newton and Leibniz actually copied it. One's not making that argument. But these things were already out there. You know, it's just like when you look at uh, the, uh, the use of uh, the decimal system, um, it was about, I think, 1100 or so that the Sanskrit texts via Arabic media were translated into Latin by Fibonacci, as we know. And the church fought uh, that for a couple of hundred years before it, uh, the negative numbers, etc. You know, this is all Brahmagupta's mathematics of the 600s was accepted in Europe. So likewise, uh, some people have argued, some historians have argued that the ideas of the Kerala School of Mathematics, the infinite series and so on, took some time to be assimilated by the scholarly world uh, in Europe. And then finally led to the flowering, uh, um, which has been traced back to Leibniz and Newton and all their successes. So, so we see a lot of threads which go back to India. And um, uh, medicine um, as well, uh, apart from inoculation, Ayurveda offers a system which is much more comprehensive than allopathy. Allopathy, as we know, the very, the very term allopathy means treatment of symptoms. So it's good, you know, you have a symptom, there's a crisis, and you know that a certain uh, medicine deals with that crisis, so you use allopathy. <clears throat> but 
Ayurveda is a comprehens comprehensive system where you deal with equilibrium of health, of wellness. And in fact, uh, recently it's been uh, um, argued uh, out of uh, logic once again uh, that uh, Ayurveda is probably or something like Ayurveda is the future of medicine because uh, on logical grounds, binary logic is not optimal, ternary logic is. Um, analysis in twos, you know, well or not well, healthy or not healthy is not optimal. Analysis in threes, which is what ternary logic is, which is where what Ayurveda does, right? You have three doshas or three gunas. So fundamentally, it is richer. It is uh, closer to optimality. So, so that is uh, uh, something that uh, um, Ayurvedic physicians need to incorporate in their case, which they make to uh, physicians everywhere. I, I think it's become very important right now for another reason. Allopathy is going through a huge crisis. There is something called the reproducibility crisis of modern medicine. And 60, 70, 80 percent of uh, published clinical research cannot be replicated. So often what happens is, uh, you know, if people do research in their labs and they set up their uh, experiments in a certain way and then they publish their work. But later on, it's discovered there is a confirmation bias. They wanted to prove something and there was funding involved and therefore uh, eventually, when it's investigated further, they are not able to replicate it. And therefore, from time to time, drugs are approved, you know, under the excitement of, hey, we have just found this discovery, and then they are not able to confirm it, and then they're pulled once again. And you also see that uh, the uh, they, uh, success or the lack of success that Western countries had, which use allopathic views to deal with COVID, the fatality rate in Europe and America was at least 10 times greater than that in India and even, you know, worse than in many other countries. So, so people are going back to it. And not only that, there is also this whole challenge that the West is facing right now, uh, that um, uh, in America, for example, 50, 60, 70% of people above 50 are on psychiatric drugs, even young, 30-40% of kids are on psychiatric drugs. In America, more than 100,000 young people, young meaning people in their 20s and 30s are dying of uh, fentanyl overdose. You know, there's addiction. There are huge um, uh, dependence on drugs. So uh, the whole question of well wellness, how do you deal with wellness, which allopathy seems to be failing at, uh, at doing, um, is is the question. So this is where uh, where a lot of uh, work will go in uh, uh, in the in the uh, in in the future. Now, before I conclude, I want to talk about uh, some of my own uh, work, which is related to uh, our Indian tradition, uh, and this uh, the basis of this was really uh, my translation of. By Sheshika Sutras, you know, in 2016, um, and and so in the back of my mind, I was aware that um, the Indian tradition, with the amazing uh, intuition or insights that the rishis had, and of course, the question before I forget, the question uh, that a skeptic very rightly would say, well, but all the coincidences, you know, the speed of light, the number of species, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or the distance to the sun. Um, it doesn't constitute a science so uh, because these are only scattered pieces of data um, so uh, where what is the epistemology of it what is the where is the source of knowledge well that's where the very foundations of uh, vedanta come in which says that as i mentioned earlier you have the outer which is apara and the transcendent, which is para. Outer is physical, the transcendent is consciousness. And ultimately, all knowledge is, is contained in consciousness. The Atman is the light which illuminates the contents of the mind. 
and knowledge comes from the Atman. And the mind does not have knowledge. The mind, uh, the mind is able to then put together these connections, uh, of course, through observations, etc. But really, the awareness is a property of the Atman. It's not a property of the mind. You know, this is something very subtle. And you have in the Mandukya Upanishad, for example, um, the three states of uh, waking, jagrat, uh, sleeping, uh, uh, dreaming, swapna, and sushupti, which is deep sleep, and the three, the fourth, which is where uh, one is in touch um, or one is one with the transcendent or with the Atman, right? So this, uh, this of course, opens up a whole world, a new world related to future of science because one of, one of the questions right now is, will computers become conscious? If computers will become conscious, the whole world will change and computers are becoming smarter and smarter, right? But um, this... According to this, well, computers will never be conscious, right? Because computers are machines. They are like the mind. They will be able to do computations. And a lot of what the mind does is computation. But awareness is a part of what the Atman does, right? So that's that's one side to it. And in fact, recently, I even published a paper using a mathematical argument showing why computers will not be conscious. But <laughs> more interestingly, uh, uh, modern science uh, has huge crises. One in cosmology, uh, modern science or physics cannot explain 96% of the cosmos. It cannot explain why stars are moving in a certain direction in various galaxies as viewed through telescopes. And for that, they have had to postulate 28% uh, of the universe is uh, dark matter. And then 25 years ago, they discovered that the whole universe is not only expanding, its expansion has accelerated about five or 10 billion years, billion years ago. And for that, they have postulated 68% of what is called dark energy. So 68 plus 28% is 96%. There's no evidence whatsoever for either dark matter and dark energy in the lab or wherever else. So you know only 4% of physical reality, right? Now that's rather uh, depressing. And in fact, out of this 4%, 3.5% is interstellar dust. So you can only speak about 0.5% of the visible universe. Not, not, not good. And not only that, if the universe is now expanding at an accelerating rate, then the whole universe will die what is called in cold freeze, because all the stars will keep on moving away from each other, and then they'll all run out of energy, and then everything will be finished. So what's the universe, right? Now, thinking about all of this three years ago, and since I do know I've done logic, uh, I I was, uh, uh, the, my, my chain of thought took me, you know, I already mentioned that ternary is superior to binary. Three-way logic is superior to two-way logic. But that is true only if uh, you are considering integer categories, you know, two, three, four. If you consider real numbers, then what is optimal is not even ternary, but what is um, E, E is 2.718, Euler's constant. That is optimal. So if you consider, well, this is mathematics. There is a mathematical theorem that E is optimal. If E is optimal, then, and if everything in physical reality is optimal, you know, you, you there are, theories in physics, which give you motions of objects, etc., dynamics from optimality principles. If everything is optimal, then maybe space is not three-dimensional, but rather e-dimensional. Space is 2.718 dimensional. So with this uh, as the intuition, I've looked at the problem of cosmology and I'm able to solve many problems. And they've been published, many, many papers. If you just Google, our e-dimensional universe, you'll find links to many, many papers which have appeared in the last two, three years. And one is also able to solve both the dark matter and dark energy problem. You don't have to postulate it. And this view tells us that maybe in a few hundred million years, the acceleration will start to decrease. And then the, all the stars will again 
come back together, you know, as in the Puranic idea that eventually everything comes back. There is creation, there is Srishti, there is Pralaya, Srishti and Pralaya, right? Now, of course, the reason why the Rishi saw it, because they saw it through consciousness. If you can be one with the para, you can then see it. It's like Srinivasa Ramanujan. He came up with all the mathematics that nobody could make any sense of. And when G.H. Hardy, his colleague at Cambridge, would ask him, hey, where did you come up with this equation? And he would say, well, I saw it in my lucid dream. Goddess Namagiri gave it to me. You know, which is where which in the Shaivite tradition, you say that uh, your consciousness is Shiva and your mind where you apprehend reality is what Shakti is or what Vimarsha is. So it's coming together of Shiva and Shakti within your mind, which is what leads to new understanding. So to conclude, uh, you know, my general presentation, Almost everything that you find in this whole Sanatan tradition is absolutely incredible. It's all scientific. It all can be made sense of through this um, dichotomy, which is fundamental to the Vedic understanding of reality, which is where modern physics is also now arrived at. You know, quantum mechanics itself, if you look at its um, standard uh, interpretation, which is called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and as I said, the creator of quantum mechanics himself was a Vedantin, and he believed that further advance in, uh, in, in physics and in psychology would have to use the ideas of these categories that we have in Sankhya. Because without that, how do you understand how, um, you know, how if you have an object and mind, where does desire come in from? You know, where does everything come in from? Where is ahankar coming from? Where is that ainas coming from? You can't explain that using reductive logic. Modern science is stuck in reductive logic. And you there is something missing, which is this the holistic side, the bigger side. And, and then the whole idea of entanglement, which in the famous dialogue between Gargi and Yagnya Valkya in the Brihad Aranik Upanishad, where Yagnya Valkya tells Gargi that, look, all these bhutas are uh, oath proth entangled with each other. Akasha is also in Vayu. Vayu is also in Tejas. Tejas is also in Apas. And Apas is already also in Prithvi. They're all together. And uh, when we say that they're separate, we are using... Uh, analy analytic categories. And finally, of course, you know, uh, the, the six great darshanas, five of them are analytical, you know, uh, uh, Purva Mimansa, Sankhya, uh, Nyaya, uh, and uh, Vedanta, um, and Vaisheshika. These are five are analytical. And the sixth is Yoga which is synthetic, which is about how to go in and make sense of all this reality. You know, if the pind, which is our inner selves, are equivalent to the cosmos, the brahmand. So how do we analyze the pind, you know, through tantra, through by going within. So all of the future of sciences, no matter what sciences, are already a part of this amazing tradition that that is a part of the Indian sciences, the whole sweep. And I think the time has come very sadly after 1947, India turned its back on all these traditions. And a lot of young people and older people in India don't know anything about this tradition. Their understanding of what uh, Indian sciences or Indian knowledge or the or yoga or Vedanta or Vaisheshika is totally, you know, ignorant. They are ignorant about it. And that's why some of them are very anti it and they are anti it because they haven't heard about it and if they haven't heard about it they say that maybe it's all been made up you know maybe people maybe this is not true how do we know what it's true so i think the time has come for them to explore not you know research publications go what the scholars both indian and western scholars are saying about it don't take anybody's word as the saying goes trust but verify and i can tell you 
from my perspective, there's nothing as amazing, as extraordinary as is the Indian scientific tradition. And it's not only the outer sciences where, once again, what Bharat has to offer is going to transform uh, modern science as well. And, uh, but also the inner sciences. And the inner sciences are very important because, okay, if you think you're nothing but the body, as is believed in the West, then you go to despair. That's why, why are people into drugs or psychiatric drugs, 60, 70% in America, or fentanyls, you know, addictions of one kind or the other, they're dying. Why? Because they're not happy, they're nothing but the body. And what the Vedas say, yes, you are the body, but you are also the Atman. That's what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. And that indeed is the truth. That's what makes sense uh, logically and and um, totally is consistent with our intuition so thank you um, vidya ji and ravi ji uh, uh, and uh, i hope i stuck to my time and i'll be more than happy of course to have a conversation with you guys and with uh, the other audience so it was a brilliant session I mean, it took me back to my engineering classes and uh, and then some <laughs> <laughs> it, it was amazing actually now how you have gone from actually the science, mathematics, and then it comes to spirituality. And you are saying that actually spirituality and science is not that different. They coexist and it has to coexist to make sense. Of course, because how do we make sense of the outer is through the inner. And the inner is what's the word spirituality mean? It means uh, related to the Atman. You know, it's the Atman is the light. In, uh, it, it is Shiva is also called Prakasha. It's the light which falls into the mind. And the mind, of course, is what organizes stuff. That's where, that's the domain of language, right? Apara. So Apara, and that then you put it all together. You know, abstractions, or you can make physical models. Now, this is what the world is like. This is what, where things are. But that is only one side. That's the toy side to it. But who is doing the watching of the toys? That's where the spirit or the Atman comes in. And I think it's sad that in the West, they have banished the Atman. That's why they're so unhappy. Now, the case could be made that maybe the West is facing a civilization collapse in so many different ways. Um, uh, you know, once you somebody has said that societies can be viewed as the waxing and waning of the moon, and once you are at the at the, at the fullest, then uh, the decline begins, and you can't stop it because there's something that happens to the minds, as is happening in the West. You know where they're saying now we're not just male or female; we are also 52 different genders in between, and we are one in the morning and second in the afternoon, and so on. And they are. It's not okay. Okay, adults can think whatever they want. They say no. We also have to tell it to children. We also have to tell it to five-year-olds. You know, rather than teachers being surrogate fathers and mothers, which is the correct way, right? Teachers are saying, no, we are activists. We have to tell them that this is what they are. People have gone crazy in the West. Totally. They have lost common sense. Mind-blowing like I expected, Subhashti. It is, uh, it's just, I've just been, uh, you know, wondering how you have managed and that you have been in a place like States and with the kind of, you know, you know uh, the backing that you have, the kind of studies that you have done, how is it that you managed to integrate it so beautifully there, despite, you know, facing so much of uh, opposition? And I'm sure you must have faced a lot of opposition. So how did you manage? Well, uh, Vidya ji, not really. Uh, what happened was, I can give you the background. It was the mid-80s, I was working on AI, natural language translation, etc. And then I remembered that my father used to talk about Ashtadhyayi and so on. Um, you know, 4,000 rules describe the entire language, which no grammar does for any other natural language. You know, there are huge grammars, you know, English, French grammars, but they don't describe complete language. And, and here, only 4,000 rules. So I said, well, let me understand where did this grammar come from? And I was astonished to read in history books that according to historians, at the time of Panani, there was no written script in India. So I said, well, that doesn't sound okay, because if there was no written script, how did he even 
come up with this list of 4,000. 4,000 is a large number. You know, normally the mind can hold five or six things at a time. Uh, 4,000 is a very long thing. How did he write it? You have to write it somewhere to keep track. Well, you can memorize once you have read something, but still, how do you make up a list? And that's what started uh, me off. And I, in the beginning, I first of all worked on the Indus script and its connections with Brahmi. And as you know, Brahmi goes back to 300 or 400 BCE. And now they've even seen Brahmi in Sri Lanka, which goes back to 600 BCE. So the standard stories are not correct. And then I said, well, um, what else did they know? So I went back in stages and, um, you know, the Upanishads or Aranyakas and the, and the Brahmanas, the texts, which are the prose commentaries and the Vedas. And studying the Shatapata Brahmana, that's how I got into archaeoastronomy. I discovered uh, Shatapata Brahmana it has a lot of stuff on the Agni Chayan ritual, which was one of the great rites which the kings used to do. And I discovered that the Agni Chan, Chayan ritual had a scientific component, which was about the movement of the sun and the moon, which is how I discovered the forgotten astronomy um, on which I wrote a book called The Astronomical Code of the Rig Veda. So when I wrote all this stuff, I sent them to journals, Western journals, Eastern journals. They all got published. I made my case. Um, I wasn't just making statements uh, in a vacuum. So I made my case um, uh, in astronomy journals, history of astronomy journals. I can tell you no problem, whatever, either there. It was later on, you know, uh, they left in India, you know, these political scientists who said, well, um, this is dangerous. Uh, what is Subhash Kat saying? But that was, that, that was not scientists. I've had no opposition in the scientific world. Um, and, and then, of course, this um, amazing uh, discovery that uh, the Vedic Rishis had, that uh, the sun and the moon are each 108 times their respective diameter from the earth, right? That the sun is 108 times its diameter from the earth, the moon is 108 times its diameter from the earth, and modern astronomy also tells you that the diameter of the sun is 108 times the diameter of the earth. If you haven't heard it, you can check it later on. The diameter of the sun is 108 times the diameter of the earth. And, okay, this equivalence, the bandhu between Pind and Brahmand, the whole cosmos is replicated in the body. Your body itself is Prithvi. You know, Bhu, Bhuva, Swaha. This is that equivalence as in the Gayatri. So Bhu is the body, uh, which is the Prithvi. And the inner sun is, um, is your Ishtadevata. So you want to make a symbolic journey. The Ishtadevata, the sun is 108 times its diameter from the earth, right? So you take 108 names of the god or the goddess. You're making each step. You're coming symbolically closer to the sun within you. Do you see that? And so Bhu, Bhuva, Swaha, they, you have the earth, which is the body. The atmosphere are the pranas, and inside you have the inner sun, Ishtadevata, Vasudeva, or Krishna, or Vishnu, or Shiva, or the goddess, whatever you want to, whosoever your Ishtadevata is. And then, if you, again, the Pinda and Brahman, the Samikaran, so if you have two things together, there will be one joining point, right? If you have two coins, put them next to each other, you'll have one joining point. If you have three, you'll have two joining points. If the body itself is sacred and it's made of 108 things, you'll have 107 joining points. In Ayurveda, you have 107 marmas. 107 marmas. The temple architecture itself, uh, from the entrance to the Garbha Griha is 54 steps, which is 108 by 2. And the perimeter is 180, which is 360 by 2. And 360, of course, is the duration of the year. I've looked at, you know, I've talked about, the, you look at music, you look at architecture, you look at sculpture. All of these things come together. Everything is sacred. Temple itself represents the cosmos. And I 
focus on many of these things in my new book, which just came out two days ago, uh, uh, The um, uh, Eternal Bharat, Truth, Meaning, and Beauty. And Truth, Meaning, and Beauty, of course, Truth is Sat, who is Vishnu. Sat is Vishnu, the entire cosmos. Vish, which pervades the whole cosmos. Meaning is Chit. Chit is consciousness, is Shiva. You know, even the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna that within you I am Maheshwara, which is Shiva. And Ananda is the sole possibility of knowing through the goddess, because our self itself is the goddess, is Prakriti, right? So truth, meaning, and ananda. Sat, truth, meaning, and, and, and beauty, which is Sat, Chit, and Ananda. So that all of this with, uh, with discussion uh, of sculpture, of music, of architecture, of meaning, of Bhatrihari, of, um, of uh, uh, the Upanishads, etc., is in this new book, uh, the uh, of titled Eternal Bharat. Uh, actually, I'm Subhashi. I'm going to put you in a bit of trouble with your colleagues. <laughs> Um, archaeoastronomy. Uh, Vidyasi's introduction was talking about archaeoastronomy. I know you have written a book on um, the archaeoastronomy of uh, the Vedas and all. So the, a, a great debate is going on on the timing of Mahabharata based on the archaeoastronomy aspect. Uh, that is, I mean, in, in my view, it is all good because everybody is studying the subject. That's why there are various opinions coming out of it. But there is a argument that archaeoastronomy using the softwares is not accurate enough. So what is your opinion on uh, dating using the uh, archaeoastronomy and uh, softwares? Or can we calculate the timing of Mahabharata and everything based on archaeoastronomy? Uh, my answer to that is um, it is useful, but it's also problematic. Uh, when these programs go further and further back in time, they're not that accurate. Um, but even if they were accurate, the other problem is to take passages from books such as the Mahabharata or the Ramayana and say that now this is what Bhishma was when he was on the bed of knaves. This was the time. There is a lot of interpretation required. And that interpretation can lead to many different um, um, results. Even if, let's say, the software the software is perfectly uh, reliable. Just to illustrate this, uh, my uh, good friend who just passed away a couple of years ago, Narhari Achar, he tried to do this uh, for the Mahabharata and he came up with the date of 3067 for a certain conjunction, which he thought was very consistent. And of course, um, the good thing about that uh, date, 30, 3068 or 3067 BCE, and the good thing is that it does seem to correspond to the uh, the traditional date, which is uh, 3137 BCE, right? Uh, because the starting of the Kali Yuga is 3101 or 3102, which is 35 years after the war, right? Uh, uh, so, so that's the good side. But there's another guy who looked at some of those passages and interpreted that somewhat differently, and he came up with 1600 BC. So I think what you what is required in using archaeoastronomy, because I have personally not used archaeoastronomy to date any of this stuff, because I am aware of the difficulties with this process. But what I've tried to do and I've tried to focus on is that you have to look at all different kinds of evidence. You also have textual evidence. You have archaeological evidence. You know, now, for example, in archaeological evidence, you have the fact that the Harappan era uh, seemed to decline starting with 1900 BCE uh, and then definitely 1700 BCE uh, when uh, many of the, uh, many of the um, towns and settlements were abandoned you know, which were on the Saraswati River. And people seem to move east and south and west, um, uh, east and south. Uh, so, so you have to see, well, what might have been the basis of it. And then there is something else. You have uh, astronomical references 
within the text, within the Vedic text, in the uh, in the Brahmanas, in the even the Upanishads, and certainly in the Puranas and the Vedas, and and these are uh, references related to uh, the fact that uh, the precession of the earth leads to shifting of the seasons 1000 years with respect to each nakshatra because the precessional cycle is 26000 years and there are 27 nakshatras or 27 or 28 so there is a shift of one nakshatra every 1000 years and you see that the various lists of nakshatras change uh, uh, going on when exactly which you know if you look at uh, later puranic uh, texts they start with uh, Ashwini nakshatra. But the earlier ones start with Kritika, which is at least 2000 years prior. So all this tells you that uh, the period of uh, the, the period that we have goes back to at least 4000 uh, 4, or 3000 to the to 4000 BCE, the fourth millennium BCE. There are certain astronomical events which are in the fourth millennium BCE or the, the whole interpretation of stories so see for example sati's sati's death you know uh, the, the the great story of shiva uh, destroying dakshas who was his father-in-law sacrifice because sati killed herself because uh, daksha didn't um, um, invite shiva but this is really an astronomical story prajapati as one nakshatra and shiva is serious and uh, and so the year, the beginning of the year shifts from Prajapati, and that's Shiva's destruction of Prajapati. And this is, in fact, a chapter in this book, um, the whole analysis of it in the book uh, uh, Eternal Bharat, which uh, your uh, readers would uh, find very, very interesting. So, so coming back to your question, definitely, if you 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 have to be as uh, as conservative as possible, because you could always say, well, everything is 50,000 years old or 100,000 years old. You have to be conservative, as conservative as possible, right? You have to see what is the material evidence that we have on the ground in terms of temples. And now you, of course, discover, discover that chariot in Sanauli also, which is about 2000 BC, because there used to be this criticism, well, there are no chariots in India or there are no representation of horse or this or that, but there's no representation of cows also. There are bulls represented. Why not cows? These are very complicated uh, stories. And, and therefore, one's got to have a multi-dimensional, independent, interlocking evidence approach to analysis. Very, very succinct, uh, uh, Subhashi. Uh, the, my, the next question is actually generally uh, you were, we were talking about the Indian mathematicians. And uh, of late, I think some of them has been recognized, like uh, Madhava, which has been added to the, some of the equations and all that. And generally, uh, generally like uh, you were saying, the left always blames that like, we have learned mathematics from the Greek. And uh, that is why it is like that. And uh, we are not actually as good as the Greek back in the day. We, we have listened to all, all these things. You, I know you have written about the mathematics also. So how do you compare both these civilizations like, you know, based on uh, their knowledge of mathematics? And uh, is there any truth in saying that we learn from Greek or is it the other way around? I, I think that um, we learn from Greeks is, is, is totally wrong. It's totally wrong for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, one is that uh, they they were Indians present in Ionia, which is Greece, which is now Turkey, because it became Turkified uh, in the Middle Ages during the Ottomans. Uh, so Indians were there a long time. In fact, um, the book, uh, uh, The Idea of India, you'll see a lot of evidence of uh, the presence of India in all of the steppe lands, you know, Central Asia, goes back very early. So India seemed to have influenced the Slavic world. And certainly everybody knows about India's influence on China and Japan. In fact, um, your readers would be uh, surprised 
and I quote with the appropriate reference, the world's leading Sinologist or scholar of China is Victor Meyer from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's written in an encyclopedia article that 40,000 words of Mandarin are derived from Sanskrit. And where did this come from? Because for a thousand years uh, in Central Asia, in China, in West China, that is, which is where the capital of China was uh, for a long, long time, uh, Sanskrit texts were translated. You know, that, that is the biggest thing going on for a thousand years. And the concepts were so unique that the Chinese were compelled to create new words corresponding to these Sanskrit words. And according to Victor Meyer, 40,000 words. Not only that, you go back now to the West, you go to the Slavic world. The chief divinity of the Slavic lands before they were Christianized a thousand years ago was a divinity that they call Svetovid or Shvetovid, the knower of light. And he had four faces. The idea of multiple faces is a uniquely Indic idea. You know, Shiva has five faces or four faces or three faces, depending upon what you're trying to represent. So, so these faces, and you know, what are those four faces of Shvetovid? This is the chief divinity of all of Europe, excepting Western Europe. For the Northern face was called Swarog. The Western face was called uh, Perkunis or Parjanya. Southern face was called Radha. And the Eastern face, face was called Mokosh. Uh, scholars have tried to give all kinds of European etymologies. Don't work. Sanskrit etymologies are perfect. Svarga, Parjanya, Lada is Sanskrit for pleasant, and Moksh, East. You know, so all of this was the, the story of uh, the silver bowl, um, um, which uh, goes back to 150 BCE, uh, which was found in Denmark. And it has images. Um, I forget the name of the bowl. It has images of a goddess being worshipped by two elephants. Elephants are not native to Europe. To Who is the goddess worshipped by two elephants? That is Lakshmi, right? Or Gaja Lakshmi. So, and you have another um, god there in this on this famous bowl, uh, who is in a uh, in a uh, representation which is almost identical to Shiva Pashupati, which you have also from the Harappan region. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on, and I think um, Western scholarship, because of its attempts to see India as being deriv derivative from Europe. Uh, has gotten stuck to certain ways and their, uh, you know, Indian followers, the left, because the left has tried to, the left's thing has been to show that this, there was really nothing in India. And all this came from, uh, from the West, really doesn't stand scrutiny at all. The more, as a historian of science, I can tell you, and I'm, it's not me, it's historians of science, the whole community from the West as well. All this, India was far ahead. In, he, even Saeed al-Andalusi, an Arab scholar writing in 1067 in present-day Spain, uh, he wrote a book um, on various nations, history of nations, and where he tried to compare sciences of various nations. And he had chapters on India, on Persia, on Rome, um, and so on, uh, Arabia and so on. And he says, the world's foremost nation of science is India. This is 1067. This is even prior to Al-Biruni. So, so this doesn't stand scrutiny at all. So Indian mathematics, of course, now is known, was far advanced. And certainly, you know, uh, you have negative numbers, etc., which we see in uh, Brahmagupta's uh, mathematics. Um, uh, and uh, and even uh, you look at uh, Aryabhata, where Aryabhata even speaks about relativity. Um, he speaks about you know you are you, you, there's a boat and uh, the motion of the boat versus uh, who's observing the boat. It's all relative. So all of these ideas very very advanced, very very advanced and sophisticated. And even uh, you know much maligned Puranas, if you see them more as a kind of a coded 
um, narrative because there uh, the 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 information that there is to uh, the 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 um, uh, the position of the moon etc is not accurate but really the uh, the idea there is that here you're looking at the representation of the Puranas within the body. You know, there's also, you have to look at this whole Pinda and Brahmanda uh, e equation. And once you do that, you find that the Puranas also make a lot of sense, a lot of sense, but they need much further uh, analysis, which they haven't yet been uh, gone through. So, Subhashti, uh, we know that you were uh, the principal, uh, uh, one of the principal, uh, I just read out, Editors for the ICO MOS project of UNESCO, identifying World Heritage Sites. How was that experience and, uh, you know, of how many uh, sites have you been able to, you know, contribute to? Well, uh, this was a UNESCO project to create a book and they had area editors. So they made me the area editor for India. So we didn't actually have to go to different sites because there are teams which do that. And so I wrote an essay on India to give the background to astronomy uh, and uh, and archaeoastronomy also comes in in ancient monuments. You know, the directions change of the stars, etc. change. So you can also date or at least get information on the relevance um, or sometimes dating of those monuments based on how they are aligned. Right. And also the relevance related to various stars and so on. You know, as, as is true of many of the great temples uh, in India, in South India, because all the temples in North India were destroyed uh, in the whole Indo Gangetic plain. The only temples that uh, survived in North India during the Turkish period uh, attacks, the only temples that survived in North India were those in the mountains or in the in the in the forests. Everything else was destroyed. So all the North Indian temples, as you know, are very recent, 200 years. Uh, you know, the Marathas then created some in uh, in uh, Banaras and Kashi and so on. But South India has amazing, you know, some of the greatest monuments in the whole world are in South India, these great temples. And some of those temples are also aligned uh, on, on the, uh, on um, you know, equinox or the, uh, the solstice, uh, some of or winter, or equinox, or spring, or falls, the light falls. For example, uh, the great temple in um, uh, Trivandrum, uh, it lights up, or everything lights up on a certain date. So these are beautiful aids to analysis of these temples, because these temples tell a story not only of the building, but also our, our understanding of reality, because Indian knowledge system is always been comprehensive in that it doesn't separate the outer from the inner and that the two are mirrored and related to each other. And this is where the whole world, world scientific tradition has come to that, that spot where it can understand it, which is why I think that the next few decades or centuries are going to be really the culmination and not only economically, um, I think uh, the Bank of America president was in Delhi a couple of years ago and he said the 21st century is going to be the Indian century because India is going to be probably the world's largest, second largest and then the largest economy. But also scientifically, also intellectually, India is going to be the center stage for all of these reasons. And I think the understanding of temples is going to be one element of that. And please do look up my chapter on temples in uh, Eternal Bharat. And I'll welcome any critique and comments that uh, your audience might have. Thank you. Thank you, Subhashi. Beautifully explained. Go ahead. David. Yeah. Subhashi, I mean, uh, you, may, you may feel that I can, I'm going I can, in all directions when I'm asking questions, but uh, since I have you, I can know I can, uh, the questions that I have in my mind. Uh, you know the the Aryan invasion theory. You have I know that you have written a book on, on it, and for a long time, I you know we have proved uh, etymologically, archaeologically, and all the geographically, all these ways that we have disproved the this uh, argument, the Aryan invasion theory. Now the people have come back with actually the genetics. Now the debate going on is actually you know, solely based on genetics, from what I'm seeing. 
and uh, there are holes in it some say uh, there is like you know it is out of india theory it is a uh, different way as like, you, know, you have done the search on it uh, how do you how do you counter like, you know, the argument that the genetics supports this iron invasion theory i don't i don't see that i let me firstly confess i have not followed the genetics argument very closely but i do know that uh, uh, that uh, first of all uh, the relationships between genetics you know the the constructions the models because what what are we doing we are we have some data uh, related to old uh, skeletons etc but we are not we don't know what how representative that was of that particular site right it's like now if you were to uh, come to um, uh, uh, an uh, african american part of the city uh, of an american city and you have a few skeletons from there you can't generalize and say that all of uh, united states was that population so you you know there are limitations but leaving that apart um, what i'm aware of is that four or five months ago there was a paper in science which is a very conservative and prestigious journal uh, which comes out of the us there was a uh, uh, there's a paper on the rise of Indo-European languages. You know, the basic thing is Indo-European languages. Where did they come from? How do Europe, Europe and India have the same languages? You know, that is the whole problem. Well, now this latest paper, in the beginning, um, 200 years ago when German universities were very uh, powerful, so the German scholars said, well, Germany was the main place. That's where they came from. You know, you see it where you feel very happy uh, seeing where it was. And then uh, as German Germany sort of was not that powerful, then they pushed it a f bit to the east. And then um, 50 years ago, it was uh, Ukraine, somewhere there, right, on this side of the Caspian Sea. But most recently, a paper written by Western scholars sees it for the first time south of the Caucasus. And south of the Caucasus is south of the Caucasus is Iran. Iran is next to India. Iran, for example, Kashmir and Iran are literally next to each other. Kashmir, uh, Afghanistan, and Iran are literally next to each other. So uh, there are, and these people also look at uh, genetics, genetic argument. So that is one side. The other side is, which is very interesting, is that um, you have, and um, you'll find a chapter or two on this in my book, The Idea of India. You have uh, words in various European languages for different concepts. For example, God. In in, in Slavic languages, you have Bhaga, or Bog, B-O-G. In uh, Latin languages, you have Div, divinity. Or, and then you have God. Right? You have three German languages, you have got G O T T. Bhaga. Now, these, and there are many others. All of those words are in Sanskrit. Bhaga, God is Swatava. And you see, this is only recently which has come up because you go back to Avestan. In Avestan, the word for God is Kavtava, which is Swatava, because Swa becomes X A W, Kwa, you know, uh, like, and from there came Kuda, from Kuda. Persian Khuda came God in German, which is God in English, right? Swatava means self-powered. Or Deva is from divinity, which is light. You have many words for land, etc. 20, 30 different words in different European countries. But you have all of them in Sanskrit. How come? If they came from a certain region of Europe, how did all of them come into, your, into Sanskrit? So I think on both these grounds, and then you look at astronomy you look at now the 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 whole word was the, the 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 chariot now you found the chariot here you have horses in india certainly um, uh, there there are papers which have been published that that's indeed there were horses as well so i think this whole aryan invasion theory is a red herring now i don't even mention the word in either of these two books uh, the idea of india because i think it's irrelevant because ultimately, India is its wisdom. You know, you look at India in Southeast Asia, you know, the great expansion, Rajendra Chola, even before that, in Bali, in 200 BC, uh, Indians were already present there. In Bhasha, Indonesia, or in Java, Javanese Bhasha, 
what is the west direction west is called the direction west is called bharat or west is india and you can check it in bhasha indonesia west is bharat this was bharat it was not it was not tamil versus sanskrit and so on sanskrit was the language you know it's a kind of a created language which was which was which was the vehicle for people from all of india uh, whether they were from the south or from the north from east or from the west and they took it i through the south to 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 southeast asia and they they were not north indians who were doing it they were probably tamilians they took it and you know, javanese bhasha is also 60 70 the old javanese is 60 70% percent sanskrit and then they took it north from there to indo china to philippines to uh, J- to japan the script used in japan even now in their temples is siddham for their mantras which is a form of you know brahmi derived all the indian scripts are derived from brahmi including tamil you know grantha malayalam or kannada or or or, or telugu and so on they all derived from brahmi so this was one and sanskrit was written in all these scripts the relationship the marriage of sanskrit and devanagari is a recent one just 200 years you know when the english came they made this standard and 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 then but prior to that sanskrit was not written in devanagari in south india it was written in the local script right so i think these things are sort of forgotten we project backwards and then we think that maybe this divide was there all, all along which is not true a fascinating uh, subhashi uh, my next question is regarding the the what you are talking about the uh, the geography i mean like i kind of where we have reached and uh, japan and all those places you know generally when we do the homers and pujas and everything we talk about the jambu dwipe uh, bharat kante and all that right and similarly there is actually the names for the other other uh, continents also pakshadeepam pushkaradeepam kraujadeepam and all that How, and in ramayana also actually you know, uh, when sugriva was talking about uh, searching in all directions actually he was going way beyond in bharat and uh, describing places what is your take on it actually you know, how how is it possible what's what's my take on it i um, i in the paper where i speak of the speed of light i bring in puranas because this was a puranic statement of 2002 yojanas in half animation so i had to sort of make it make a sense of it in the puranic thing and that's where the dwipas come in and my uh, take there and you can check it out because that paper is on archive my take it on that is that this is a conception of you know the various concentric dwipas you know you have the sea of milk and the sea of this so this is a representation because as i said the puranas are a coded representation of the cosmos the physical cosmos the solar system and the reality so they are not you're not always talking about the world uh, from the earth you know because then you can't explain hey why do the puranas speak of the moon at this location which is not true at all because there you're looking at it in relation to uh, the navel being the central region and the sun and the moon are also mirrored within the body so it's a it's something where a lot of decoding still needs to be done but i do explain all these dwipas so you and your uh, um, other listeners might want to um, explore that because i have all the numbers from the puranas and i come up with a uh, with a plausible system which explains which fits them to the solar system so please do take a look and the, the title Absolutely. of that paper is the speed of light and puranic cosmology or something so i do precisely Uh, address this question absolutely absolutely i'll i will definitely read on that and uh, next one is you know now it is a time of revival you know we have ayodhya uh, i didn't believe in my lifetime i would see it but we are lucky enough to see it and there is like a very successful litigations is going on on other sides also like uh, kashi and uh, mathura and all those things are going uh, uh, 
how do it, how is that you know all these sites are actually becoming very important to our culture and actually the way that we are going forward there are many people who have thoughts on actually these are our old sites what is to do with the new india you know probably we should be focused on energy on other things and all that but uh, these are uh, you know the monumental or pivotal uh, places in, in in our culture uh, uh, you know i would like to listen to your your thoughts about it uh my uh, take on all this is that we um, you know india first of all i'm absolutely convinced and just like uh, um other scholars that uh, that uh, india is going to be the central uh, civilization over the next uh, century and longer for a variety of reasons first of all uh, you know the, re- the the primary reason is that until about 1200 ce india's share of the world economy was has been estimated to have been about 35 to 45% of the entire earth and china was second at about 30% uh when they during the 6 700 years of you know unsettled situation wars you know the turkish invasions uh huge horrific things the bahmani kingdom uh, according to farishta the persian chronicler of the bahmani kingdom which was north of vijayanagar empire they had a uh, they had a target of slaughtering at least 100000 hindus a year did you know about that you must uh, look it up so there was horrible times the universities are all destroyed and the great kerala school of mathematics the family it the sciences was sort of became limited to families but not not the universities the great you know they they were just uh, destroyed so uh, when the english came uh, 1800 it's estimated that india share of the world economy was still 20% during the 19th century as europe industrialized you know they had the industrial revolution in india they first of all they broke india's economy by putting tariffs and then they didn't make any investment in factories here so india had famines it estimates about 100 million people extra million people died in india which have been called late victorian holocaust and it's been estimated that in 1914 uh india's share of the world economy had shrunk to 1.4% from 20% now in the last 10 15 years it's climbing up again to 6 7% in ppp terms but nowhere near 30 or 40% but india has a long way to go indians are you know doing very well everywhere and the reason why it's not that there's not anything so fundamentally different from between indians and anybody else but indian way of looking at reality provides us certain advantages which we want to share with everybody else this is a comprehensive view of looking at reality reality is not just physical things because if they were just physical things then there's no meaning there's no long, greater sense the idea of atman is central to indian civilization and this idea personally you know this uh, paper that i published 3 or 4 months ago as a mathematical theorem and again you can look it up it's called no go theorems in machine consciousness where i show that consciousness cannot be material cannot be physical consciousness cannot be a product of the brain consciousness is transcendent it is of course a part of us but consciousness atman is everywhere including in us it's like uh television energy electromagnetic waves are everywhere and they energize each television receiver or radio waves are everywhere so the radio wave waves the listen what we listen to don't don't come from the receiver so likewise we are uh, the atman is everywhere so long as our physical body is okay we can that light illuminates the brain the contents of the brain if the physical body is damaged um, the brain is damaged then of course they don't illuminate so you have dementia or you have or you can't do things right but this is the model and i think this model makes sense mathematically logically in my own papers for example and large epistemologically 
they help us look at physical reality differently, um, our inner reality differently. And modern sciences have come to a frontier where the unknown is consciousness, which is what the Atman is all about. So I think this is going to be the biggest thing. We should be ready. And in order to have that confidence, I think it will be very important for us to be connected to all these sacred sites. These are incredible sites, you know, Ayodhya and Mathura, because look, the, the greatest book of yoga is the Bhagavad Gita. And Mathura is the place of the Bhagavad Gita. We must celebrate it. The whole world should celebrate it. Sanatan is for the entire humanity. Right? So I think we should celebrate it. For that reason, I'm all for, you know, renewal of all these sites. Not just in, not the ones that were destroyed in the north, but el the, the ones which were destroyed elsewhere as well. Deji, go ahead. Uh, so, Subhashi, this question actually arises from the, uh, you know, you had sent me the the Bharati bibliography and I was, uh, you know, awestruck when I saw the different types of articles that, um, you know, journals that you have mentioned. So my question is, it's, it's a personal one. The kind of subjects that are there is an array. It's an array it's, and it's a wide spectrum. And you have beautifully, you know, crisscrossed and brought them together. And it's, you know, it's it's mind boggling for any lay person. So I just wanted to know what set it off. You know, it's like a cascade. For so many years, you've been writing books and journals and articles. So what was it that started it? You know, that the first uh, point of interest. And from there, you have been just going on and on. <laughs> and well, so what is your... What, what, what started this was really, as I uh, told you, uh, the story about uh, Ashtadhyay, and then that got me to the Indus script. Basically, you know, I asked myself, I said, okay, what is life all about? If you have a question and you want to find an answer, you go through it. Now, you, of course, you could also wait for the experts to do it. But if the experts are not doing it, well, what choice do you have but to do it? Right. What choice do you have? Uh, let me give you um, a more uh, recent story. Uh, when I started, this is three and a half years ago, when I started looking at e-dimensionality and the physical universe. And I, you know, this published in leading journals, many, many papers, solves the dark matter, dark energy. That doesn't mean that the whole world has adopted it. You know, science is a conversation and I put it out there and people will come back and wherever it goes. But the next thought that came to me is, if the physical universe is e-dimensional, so should be the universe of biological information. So in a flash in one afternoon, I said, well, maybe it should also help us understand the genetic code. And let me also tell you, and this is the, the personal aspect of the question. Uh, as the Kano Upanishad says, knowledge does not come from the mind. It comes from the Atman. Every any human being can only be the medium or madhyam. We can only be the medium. If you are ready, the goddess shall speak through you. So that afternoon, in two hours, I wrote a paper on the genetic code. And it's been published. There are two papers that have already appeared in print, which solve an old problem of the genetic code. You know, genetic code is at the basis of all of medicine. I know nothing about medicine or genetic code. So I don't know where it came from. So the problem with genetic code is you have 64 codons. You know, you have four bases four, and each codon has three bases, four to the power three, 64. 64 codons and you have 20 amino acids. They map into 20 amino acids. Why is it that some amino acids have as many as six codons? And why do you have, why do you have that some amino acids have only one codon. If you wanted to design it in an engineering way, you'll assign the same number of codons to each amino acid. You know, 20 times 3 is 60. So about three to each. But some have one. Many have only one. Some have six. And let me tell you, the complete solution comes out of e-dimensionality of the genetic code. Where did it come from? It didn't come from me. I knew nothing about the subject. I wrote that paper in just one or two hours. Most of my papers... In, have come just like this. You know, it's something like what um, 
our dear friend Srinivas Ramanujan used to say. I don't know where these equations come from. So you have to be ready. If you think you are doing it, you will never get it. You have, you can only be the medium. The goddess speaks through you, through each one of us, through every human being. Every human being is equal to every other human being. But if you don't have ego, ahankar, ahankar is that what creates that wall. If you just let go, let the goddess speak through you. And that's the, then the universe will go where it's got to go. We can only be the instrument, you know, nimitta matra. That's all we can be. Excellent. Uh, Beautifully explained, uh, Subhashti. Yeah. That's uh, Krishna's <laughs> words to Arjuna. Nimitta matra bhava savya sache. Perfect. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I think there's, there's such beautiful lessons. You know, the Bhagavad Gita, of course, we all started doing it when, when we were children. It's difficult at that time to really comprehend it intuitively. But really, if you think of it, every word is so beautiful and it's all universal. Whatever is being told to us and to young Indians and to the leftists that Sanatan is hierarchical, it's casteist, it's all false. You know, it's got to be eradicated. Sanatana, every human being and even Pashus have the same Atman. We are all equal. It doesn't matter who, where you come from, which Jati, which race, which part of the world. We are all equal. Even animals are. We can even communicate with them. So this is the future. You know, we should also be compassionate to other animals, not kill them mass kill them as they do in the West. You know, you have these animal factories. It's horrible. And firstly, they're they are given these uh, antibiotics. They're fattened. And then they're slaughtered. And then people eat meat from morning to night. I'm not against meat eating. What I'm saying is, treat. you know, they're all, they're also part of the food chain. Matsyanyaya. The big fish must eat the smaller fish just to survive. Not against meat eating at all. In fact, Kashmiris, eat meat universally, although I'm a vegetarian now for many years, but we have to have compassion. The world cannot progress without compassion, not, not only for other human beings, but also for the Pashus, also for other animals. Only then will we have uh, proper, you know, proper energy which will raise everybody. Because right now, the West is going through a horrific crisis. Why? Whatever is happening where people are feeling totally alienated is because they are alienated from nature. Ultimately, you know, the greatest teacher is Prakriti, is the goddess, in its in a various different forms. And even Europe, when Europe got alienated from nature uh, uh, after it became Christian, it, it got into the dark ages. It's only when in the scientific revolution it said, okay, we're going to let nature guide us, that once again it got on the right track. You can't have any ideology teaching us. The only ideology is the goddess or nature. You don't want to use the word goddess for whatever reason. Okay, nature, let nature teach you because there's no other teacher. Excellent. Uh, so, Bashi, I think actually we are approaching the time to finish, but I will ask the last question, I guess. Um, see, the West has started to recognize actually our potential and has, uh, you know, uh, appreciated our efforts and everything in the recent times. Even yesterday, there was a news saying that, you know, the German university has discovered the building blocks of the, the, the Milky Way, and they called it Shu Shakti, uh, which is very... Really Happy to hear and like, how they are recognizing it in our traditions and like, you know, our scientific temper for that matter. But for a very long time, uh, India was actually intellectual slavery. Slavery is existing in India and still exists in, in many ways. From the likes of, uh, you know, Pollock or Ramachandra Guha or, you know, many Westerners, even, you know, so many of them. So you are, a, you are the forefront of actually writing about uh, our culture and uh, our, in, our intellectual wisdom in art and science and all those things. In your opinion, actually, you know, what is the way forward in bringing out our self-esteem and uh, 
uh, you know coming out of this intellectual slavery so to say uh be open minded also be skeptical truth what bharat is ultimately about is truth be wedded only to truth uh speak uh, first of all have confidence approach look at all of these texts i can tell you from my experience there's nothing as beautiful and ex- as extraordinary as the indian tradition not just the shastric books but even the puranas if you get to know how to decode them everything is beautiful these were all rishis or they were sages they were scientists they were scientists with this difference that they looked at both modes of learning and knowing and what's to be known both these aspects which of which only one aspect existed in the western tradition because the western tradition even if you go back to the greek religion was more objective based even the greek gods were like us sitting up in the sky right zeus and his other assistants which is not the the vedic gods are within us they are a they are they are like the lenses each devata is like the lens through which we are connected to this atman or paramatma you can talk of okay from a perspective you can say okay i also believe that jivatma and paramatma are different and you go through different cycles you know depending upon what your theological position is which is perfectly fine because that's a that's where you're using apara language in apara language there will be differences but in reality go back to the vedas they are all systematic and they all are together and all if you want to read their summary in the bhagavad gita let that guide you and let you question yourself the witness the sakshi within you don't take anything just because it sounds good have the sakshi who's your teacher the krishna within you we are only the arjuna right the krishna within you guide you and guide you with compassion we are all truly equal and all the stuff that's being hurled at us is totally wrong let that roll off like water on the hamsa's back right this the swan this knowledge related to you know the hamsa so i think that is the way I have confidence and let's not be dis- disrespectful to others uh take the high road and you know if there's a beautiful horse which goes into a village the dogs will try to you know snip it at its heels so there will be bad people trying to say all kinds of stuff let's ignore them you know just ignore them barking dogs do our stuff be truthful um and also be accepting of everybody else take the best from all cultures you know there's wonderful stuff which has also emerged elsewhere we accept everything we it's nothing superior versus inferior i think personally it's the most extraordinary thing that there is life transforming um and connects you to what everybody's purpose in life should be and you know uh dharma morality moksha freedom and in between and these are the two god rails artha and kama desire and ambition let everybody be ambitious follow desire so long as they're within the god rails of morality and freedom and by freedom this means you know what freedom here really means is freedom where paradoxically you are connected to the will of the gods where that freedom the true freedom as kena says where it's not you who does it you are a part of the larger flow so that is what uh, we should be doing and this will lift the whole world not just us absolutely the amazing it's a very very good answer for that and uh, you know i hope i can our questions or questions are all right and did you enjoy the session wonderful thank you very much truly a great session and i hope uh, your uh, listeners uh, found it useful as well but truly to all the listeners believe in yourself this this is beautiful and it, it this is not to run away from the world do all this and be a part of this world which is also a great adventure you know part of the great leela of which we are constituents absolutely thank you
no it was a mind blowing session like i had said earlier uh, subhashi and towards the end it was you know i think leading into a very spiritual uh, feeling also we are feeling so uplifted so thank you so much we are really really grateful that you took the time you know and joined us here we are so honored to have you amongst us thank you so much thank you thank you ravishankar ji and vidya ji thank you very much thank you so much thank you